Welcome to the Clinical Center Grand Rounds, a weekly series of educational lectures for physicians and healthcare professionals broadcast from the Clinical Center at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. The NIH Clinical Center is the world's largest hospital devoted to investigational research, and it leads the global effort in training today's investigators and discovering tomorrow's cures. Learn more by visiting us online at clinicalcenter.nih.gov. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming to Grand Rounds this week. Um, I'd like to welcome you to a special uh, Clinical Center Grand Rounds as we kick off Patient Safety Awareness Week. Um, for this talk, the Hopkins CME code, also seen up here, is today 50547. That's 50547. Please text this code to the Johns Hopkins CME phone number on the slide to receive CME credit for this lecture. We kindly invite you to provide feedback for today's lecture by scanning the QR code shown on the CME slide. For those applying for CME, you will receive the feedback survey link via email. The survey will be used to provide us with important feedback about the presentation and allows you to submit any suggestions for future Grand Round topics. Questions for the speaker today can be submitted at any time during the lecture by scrolling down and clicking the Live Feedback button located on the Videocast website. Questions will be answered, if time permits, at the conclusion of the presentation. And of course, for those here in the auditorium, we will take live questions. So let me, a word on Patient Safety Awareness Week. Patient Safety Awareness Week was founded in 2003 by the National Patient Safety Foundation, which later merged with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, known as the IHI. This week was established to encourage everyone to learn more about healthcare safety, to advance important discussions locally and globally, and to inspire action to improve the safety of the healthcare system for patients and the workforce. At the NH Clinical Center, we are guided by our individual and collective passion for high reliability in the safe delivery of patient-centric care in a clinical research environment. For us, we know that safe and high-quality patient care are integral to the world-changing clinical research. This year, Patient Safety Awareness Week is celebrated March 10th through 16th, and we started off a few days early today with our Grand Rounds. Our speaker today is Colonel Stephen L. Coffey. Colonel Coffey is a career military officer and serves at the, as the Chief of Staff at the National Security Agency, a senior representative to the Defense, Department of Defense and the Defense Intelligence Agency. He holds a Bachelor's in Political Science from Morehouse University, a Master's in Legislative Affairs from Georgetown University, George Washington University, excuse me, from George Washington University, and a Master's in Clinical Quality, Safety, and Leadership from Georgetown University, and a Certificate in Diversity and Inclusion from Cornell University. Additionally, he has completed numerous programs through the National Defense University and the Air Force Air University. Colonel Coffey has commanded and led at all levels, from being the Force Support Squadron Commander at the National Reconnaissance Office in Chantilly, Virginia, to most recently serving as the Director of Human Resources for the National Security Agency Central Security Service. He deployed to support Operation Enduring Freedom and Freedom Sentinel in Afghanistan, and Operation Spartan Shield and Inherent Resolve in the Middle East. He served as a military aide to two U.S. presidents on the social staff. As a White House social, military social aide, Colonel Coffey facilitated the planning and execution of all events and official functions on behalf of the President and the First Lady of the United States. Colonel Coffey's passion for patient safety was birthed through his son's experience, and we'll hear more about that during his presentation. He is the President and CEO of Head to Heart Connections, LLC, and a founding member of Patients for Patient Safety, U.S. chapter of the World Health Organization. He served as a charter member and first community chair of MedStar Georgetown University Hospital Patient and Family Advisory Council for Quality and Safety, and sits on Patient and Family Advisory Councils for the MedStar Health System and the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine. 
Colonel Coffey serves on numerous nonprofit boards of directors and is an adjunct faculty member with the MedStar Institute for Quality and Safety, Academy for Emerging Leaders in Patient Safety, and an advisor to Georgetown University Medical School Rare Diseases Student Organization. Additionally, he serves on numerous technical expert panels with the Yale New Haven Health Services Corporation and Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, he is an in international speaker and panelist with organizations such as CMS, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the National Organization for Rare Diseases, AARP, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. He was recently appointed to the American Board of Internal Medicine, Governance for Internal Medicine Board. Finally, Colonel Coffey is a best-selling children's book author of Baby Stevens' Gift of Life. Now, please welcome our speaker, Colonel Stephen Coffey, for his presentation entitled, Engaging Patients as Partners to Improve Diagnostic Safety. Thank you so much for that very warm and kind introduction. I think I probably need to meet the person that uh, you're introducing there. Um, it is really a great day to be here with all of you. Uh, both in person and online. I will tell you that any time that you can get out of the Pentagon is a fantastic time, uh, having worked in that building. Uh, also, you know, one of my favorite morning radio uh, hosts, Tom Joyner, used to say, I don't give shout-outs, but if I did, I'd give one. So I don't normally give shout-outs in presentations, but if I did, I would give one to a very dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Courtney Fitzhugh-Joseph, who is here with us today, and a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Dillner, who is also watching virtually. So thank you all so much for coming. It is always good to be in the presence of some of friends. Uh, standard disclosures that I put on the screen, and so you can read them on the, on the screen, but in essence it says that the views that I will uh, present today, those opinions that I present today, those are mine. They do not represent the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, the Air Force, or the National Security Agency Central Security Service, so we want to make sure we have that. One of the standard things we do in the military is that we generally start briefings by telling you what we're going to tell you, we then tell you, and then we wrap up by telling you what we told you, so I won't, uh, I won't stray too far from, from that. Uh, but before I really get into uh, my talk today, I wanted to at least touch on the Patients for Patient Safety U.S., which is an organization that I founded with nine other titans in the field of patient safety, activism, and advocacy. And so, as with most grassroots organizations, it generally starts around the kitchen table because all nine of us have in some way experienced medical harm and diagnostic error. And so we gathered around this kitchen table to really uh, address this, and we said, what can we do because we have this common theme and thread amongst all of us that we've experienced this harm. And so we came up with uh, establishing the U.S. chapter of the World Health Organization's Patients for Patient Safety U.S. And so one of the things that we've done in our uh, organization is we've had these very provocative titles for papers that have been published, such as Who Killed Patient Safety? And in that, we've all seen and read the reports of the IOM in 99 that talked about uh, the, the challenges in healthcare and how we lose hundreds of thousands of people due to medical error, medical and diagnostic error. And so we've looked at ways that we as a collective patient voice can help change that culture in medicine. And so what I uh, would show is that we have these strategic alliances with people from around the country who have joined us uh, and signed on. And so there is but a passionate plea and ask that if you would like to join and sign on as a supporter of this idea of changing the culture of medicine to go look at our webpage, pfps.us, and find out more about it. We have institutional partners, but we also have individual partners that are champions. And of course, they span the globe, uh, certainly around this country and, and distant disciplines. And so again, just ask that you would go and have a look at that page and see if you are able to join and support us in our efforts. So, I think that it is appropriate for us to start today with a little bit of a coffee break, right? When I think about my son, um, I use a quote by Charles Dickens, one of my favorite authors, and he says that it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. Those words never rang more true than with the birth of my son, Stephen Coffey II. In his life, my life would change forever, 
and the world will be introduced to a living miracle. And so with this coffee break, a little bit of a play on my last name, I think helps us to set the stage. So I'm going to try without my uh, normal admin staff to help me to get the video to play. So we'll see how this goes. That video gets me every single time, every single time. That's my son, Stephen. I call him Deuce. He was born on September the 28th, 2012. And I was so excited because I knew that I would have a son to carry on the good name. And, and, and if you pause for a moment and you see, that's my hand that's cutting the umbilical cord. And I think y'all gave me the dull pair of scissors because that was a lot more difficult to cut than what it looked like on YouTube and what I thought. But see, y'all don't trust me. <laughs> but I was so excited because I was going to have a son. And when the nurses took him, they took him away to run newborn screening tests. And they came back and they said that he had this high bilirubin, low glucose. He was a little bit jaundice, but they assured me he would be okay. And what I found out later is that it would bridge the gap. This, this, this information they gave me would set me off on a path that would really change the trajectory in my life. And as we go through the talk today and his experience, I want to use as a point of reference the National Academy of Sciences and Medicine, uh, this diagnostic process, this map, so that we have a place where we can pinpoint where I think patient engagement can help to make care safer and make it better. So you fast forward, you'll remember that we've been going back and forth to the hospital because of this bilirubin. It's been high many, many times. And we received a call one night from one of his providers who had a very pronounced accent. And so I put this provider on a speakerphone. Now, in my mind, I thought that putting the provider on a speakerphone would alleviate the confusion that would occur between myself, my wife, and the provider because we're on speakerphone. And the, the provider says, Stephen has galactosemia you need to take him to a larger hospital and tell them he has galactosemia. Now pause for a moment and think about the barriers that start to manifest themselves in communication. There's a barrier in that this provider is on a speakerphone. There's a barrier of communication in that the provider has a very pronounced accent. There's a barrier in that the provider said you, the layperson, needs to go to a larger hospital without calling him ahead and tell them that he has this metabolic condition called galactosemia. And for those who are unaware or maybe have forgotten, galactosemia is a metabolic condition whereby his body cannot break down the simple sugar galactose that's found in human and animal milk. So there was a barrier in communication. You fast forward, we go to this hospital, we've gone and we've seen these people and they run tests and they say, it's not galactosemia, it's only a treat. And they discharge us. In the very same day that we're discharged, we happen to get a phone call from the smaller hospital, and they say, he has galactosemia, you need to stop giving him milk. And we said, wait, we were just discharged five hours ago. 
And they said it's only a trait. They said don't change his diet. Don't stop giving him milk because it would affect him and his ability to take milk later on. And the smaller hospital, despite having the correct diagnosis, said defer to the larger hospital. In this instance, size does not always matter. You fast forward to Thanksgiving night, and I am really excited because I am going to go do battle. I am dressed in my very comfortable clothes to get out in the Black Friday shopping. My wife is not the shopper. I am the shopper in the house. I am dressed ready for battle to get to Walmart to get the G.I. Joe with a Kung Fu grip. And I get a phone call from my wife. And she says, something is wrong with Stephen. And so I'm a little annoyed because I've, I've got this, this one last, like, Furby. And she wants me to come home, and so I come home. And we go to the military treatment facility that's only literally two minutes from my house. I lived right outside the gate. And we go in, and I see this doctor in the ED, and I say, something's wrong with my son. I'm dressed in my comfortable clothes. I have a, he has a lump on his leg, and this doctor looks at me and says, you're overreacting. It's only fatty tissue or swollen lymph node. I am perceived as the overreactive parent. My wife is the overprotective mother. And so we dismissed and we felt like we weren't heard and we get discharged and go back home. And the doctor had told us, if it starts to spread more, come back. The very next day, the spreading had gone from his, um, from his general area, across his generals rather, for the entire time. And at that time when I came back, I came back dressed like a colonel. I came back different. The nomenclature, the vernacular, the words I used made sure that he understood that I had this TSSEI clearance with a bunch of accoutrements behind my name. He understood and tests were run at that time. You fast forward from that moment and we found ourselves on November the 28th at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in the PICU. Now understand, I did not know that the PICU is where we send our sickest kids. And my son is in the PICU, and there's a resident who is presenting my son to the attendings, and they say, this is Stephen, our two-month-old from an outside hospital who has fulminant liver failure secondary to galactosemia. Five days later, Stephen became the youngest patient in the country in 2012, and certainly for a number of years afterwards, to have a liver transplant. And so what he is now is an 11-year-old boy. He's uh, an accomplished author with me as well, and he's living a pretty decent life. He's doing quite well. But the thing I want you to take from the story is that this thematic notion that I felt that I wasn't heard. I felt that I was overlooked. And what you'll find is that oftentimes uh, patients have this sense of when I feel like I'm not heard, I perceive that there is diagnostic error. There's a, there's a problem with the medicine I'm receiving. And in fact, NIH, uh, IHI rather, did a study in 2017 that validates that, that the most common contributing factor to patients feeling that they have experienced diagnostic error is they felt that they weren't heard. But oftentimes we think that not being heard means that I'm not just being seen. But there's a different nomenclature that we use as patients to express I'm not being heard. There's access to care. So many people think of access to care as can you get to the care facility? In my case, that was not the case. I, I could get to the hospital within two minutes, but I didn't have access to information. There's something that's missing. I feel there's something missing in how you're explaining to me about my son. I'm not being heard. I didn't know who to call when there was this lump on his leg, and I don't know what to say or who I should talk to to express my concerns. There's confusing, there's conflicting information. He has galactosemia. It's a trait of galactosemia. The patients feel that we're not heard. Ultimately, you understand that patients have a different taxonomy, a different language that we use when we're communicating to providers. Now, so it's interesting. If I were to take a poll of the audience and ask you, uh, how would you caption this picture? Many of you would say it's a giraffe that's painting a woman. I did ask my son uh, the same question uh, when I was pulling the, the slides together, and he said, well, it's a giraffe that's painting, that, that's painting a hat. And truthfully, he's not wrong. Now, I, I I've got to give some credit because a dear friend and colleague, uh, Seagal Bell, 
uh, allow me to use a couple of slides that we've done in the presentation before, so I want to give her uh, some credit where credit is absolutely due. But to that point of perspective, the slide talks about perspective. Patients have a very different perspective of medicine. And what's important to understand about that perspective is that patients have what we call experiential intelligence. So I don't know what it feels like to have had a liver transplant. My son does. I may not understand what it feels like to be sedated and have a biopsy. My son does. I can tell you what my son's AST, ALT, GGT, prograph levels were from the time he started December 5th to this morning and tell you when they ebbed and flowed, went up and down, and how he felt and how that affected him. There's an experiential intelligence that I bring. There's a different data point that as a patient I bring. And it's important that we start to use these different data points as we look at how we do medicine. What I think is that when we start to use the different data points that patients bring as a part of the, cl the clinical care team, we can then identify blind spots. And so it's interesting when I was doing the uh, preparation for this, you know, I was thinking about blind spots, and there's an actual model for finding blind spots. Uh, it's called Jahari's Window, and it was made up by two, two uh, psychologists, uh, Joseph Luth and Harry Ingram in 1955, who merged their first names together to come up with Jahari, which I thought was kind of clever. And it talks about blind spots. So what you'll find is a normal X, Y axis uh, for the chart, and there's things that you know about yourself that others don't know. There are things that you don't know about yourself that others know. There are things that are unknown to all people. And so when I look at this, when I look at these quadrants, there's information you know about you that others know. And what I like to call that is that's, that's shared knowledge. That's open, the open self. That's what Jahari would call the open self. But there's also information that you know about you that others don't know about you. Now, while Jahari may call that the facade, I call that that's your secret. That is your secret. Who you are at work may not be the same person that you are at home. But there's, this, there's another place that we talk about where there's information that is unknown to both you and unknown to others, and that is truthfully just the unknown. But there's this magical place where there's information that is known to others that you don't know. And that place is what they call the blind spot. I call that the gossip. Now, I understand Oh, that doesn't happen at, at NIH. It, there's no gossip here. There's only gossip in the DOD. So I will, I will claim that one for us. But that blind spot of information that you don't know, when we put that into the context of medicine, there's a blind spot that we often can find because patients have data points that we don't know. And so when we think about these patient-identified blind spots, there's a study done by Gillespie and Reader that had 22,000 patients who read their ambulatory notes, and 50%, more than 50% of them, identified diagnostic breakdowns and blind spots. And those blind spots included things like wrong symptoms. Those blind spots included omissions and missing information. So when we start to really utilize patients and their voice and understand that they provide data points which inform us and cover up those blind spots, we then start to make much better care, much safer care, and ultimately more inclusive care. Now, when I think about how we talk about this, how we start to look at patient engagement for diagnostic safety, I think we have to get back to the basics because I don't want to come and present a problem without presenting possible solutions. And I can think of no more of a basic way than to get back to what we call the ABCs. And the first one is to accept patients as partners. Now, I would take a guess and uh, believe that many, if not all of you, have taken the Hippocratic Oath. You know, all those online, if you're clinically trained, you've probably taken the Hippocratic Oath. And I would argue that many of you could probably uh, recite the oath right now if called upon to do so. Now, when you think about the oath, it starts by saying, I will fulfill according to my ability and my judgment the following oath and agreement. But nowhere in that Hippocratic Oath does it talk about patients. But that's who you're here to serve. But it's not in the oath that you initially start to take. And so you have to understand that patients may not have the technical terms that you would use, but patients have value and they bring in a perspective. Now understanding that, uh, understanding the patient perspective also means that there has to be a bit of trust. 
And so I believe doctors go into medicine and they want to save and, and help patients, and that is why you do what you do. Um, but understand that medicine has always been and will ever, forever be a people business. There's a bit of trust that has to occur there. Trust that me as a patient believes that you are here to help me and that you value me. And trust that I, you as a provider, trust that me as a patient, I'm going to come and be open and honest with you about the things that concern me. There's a bit of trust that has to be, that has to be established. Shared decision making is more than a bumper sticker that sounds good. It's something that we have to institutionalize with our values of trust. But then there's this idea of breaking down barriers. And, and, and I specifically look at this because I think about this idea of promoting psychological freedom by, with, and through the staff. Let's use this idea of escalation. So oftentimes we have uh, challenges and hierarchies in the hospital, and people are afraid to come escalate. I use an example about sepsis. Uh, do our frontline first points of contact, do those persons, are they trained to recognize the signs and symptoms of sepsis when they're doing intake of a person in an emergency department? Are the housekeeping staff, the food nutrition staff, are they trained in those types of things to help escalate? Do they feel comfortable to tell leadership, to tell other attendings and nurses and providers, here's something that I see, and oh, by the way, is their opinion respected? Breaking down those barriers that happen in the hospital within the staff. But there's also this notion of breaking down the barriers of this sort of parent-child relationship that occurs in medicine. So in a parent-child relationship, I as a parent tell my son, son, go do this. Don't ask me questions, just do this, because I know what's best for you. Conversely, when I put that into terms of medicine, when I as a patient come into a hospital, do you have that same parent-child relationship? I'm the doctor, you're the patient, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you. Or do you flip the script and say, let me hear what you say, and we try to get to consensus together? Understand that breaking barriers really starts at the C-suite, though. It requires leadership to look at themselves as thermostats, not thermometers. The thermometer takes the temperature. The thermostat sets the temperature. So really understanding that our C-suite has to, again, have this idea that we have this, this psychological freedom across the staff and that we will break down the barriers where we can to improve safety, to improve quality, to improve patient inclusivity. And the last thing I talk about is, you know, we think about this idea of communication. And communication is really one that is, um, it's hard. Because a lot of times we think we're communicating well and we're really missing the mark. So I go back and I think about a situation, um, you know, for those who are in, like sports, we just finished up the Super Bowl a couple weeks ago. And I thought the 49ers were going to win. I was sort of rooting for the 49ers. We've got some 49er fans in the audience here and online. I see you. Um, <laughs> I was excited and I was like, man, they're going to win. They're going to run away with this. But Andy Reid took his team into the locker room at halftime and he gave them feedback. Now, my wife, she's a huge New Orleans Saints fan, and she always tells me whenever I give a talk that I need to remind people of 28 to 3. So apparently there's the rivalry. If you were a Saints fan, you saw the Falcons choke 28 to 3 against the Patriots. So, Cezanne, I did that one for you. So, <laughs> but what happens in sports and why I appreciate it is that they get feedback. They get instant feedback, and they're able to go change the course of action. And you can tangibly see the change after feedback. How do we do feedback in the hospital? So there's communication that we have to do of making sure that we take those preemptive timeouts before we do a procedure. There's tools like SBAR that we've all accustomed to that we have to make sure we continue to reinforce. There's this idea that when we talk about communication, and I tell the people that work for me all the time, your job is not to speak so that you're understood, because if there is a lack of fundamental knowledge, no matter how many times you reiterate your point, it doesn't connect. Your job is to speak so that you're not misunderstood. It's a very different way of thinking about it. Let me engage you as a patient so that we have a common sense of here's what we need you to take away from this. Right? Now, the thing that, I, that I'll go to and... You know, as an active duty Air Force officer, you know, I had to throw some planes in here because this, that's what we do. Uh, you know, I, I definitely, Captain, you know, got to represent the Air Force here. <laughs> but the one thing that we have in the Air Force um, for our pilots is we have these things called knee boards. 
And a knee board is, is absolutely what it looks like. It is a board strapped to your knee that has your flight plan and has all the things that you're going to have to do uh, to make sure that your mission is completed successfully. And so I wanted to provide you with what I call the uh, engaging patient knee board. And again, it starts with uh, the patient and family and understanding that perspective. And the one thing that if you had to take one slide away from this presentation, this is that one. Uh, the first thing that I would have you all to remember is that when a patient comes into the hospital, it is a significant emotional event every single time a significant emotional event. Whether I'm going to the hospital with my son for the first time or 11 years post-transplant is a significant emotional event. You know, I talk about, I work in the Pentagon, and if you've ever been to the Pentagon, it is the largest low-rise office building in the world, 26,000 people that work in this facility every single day. And when you walk in, people are a little surprised because we have both Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts on the same floor. They compete to see who makes the best pumpkin spice latte. And so I go in there and I take people on tours of the building. And they're, they're amazed because it's also a living museum, but it's an office space. But I'm oblivious to everything that is on the walls, everything that are in the display cases, because I see it every single day. How does that translate to medicine? As a patient... You may not understand what I, under, what I see when I come here. You may not realize how poor the signage is, how bad the parking is, <laughs> how bare the walls look. Every single time I come to the hospital, it's because I'm sick or someone I know is sick. Coming to the hospital is a significant emotional event. But not only understanding that patient perspective and that voice, it's respecting that voice. Patients have to come in with trust that I am going to tell you the things that bother me, and you have to trust my perspective that I'm going to listen. When patients come in and say, hey, my left arm is hurting, and you've done your analysis, and you've done the clinical care plan, and you find it's not your left arm, it's really your right arm, I need you to come back to me and say, but your left arm is it's good. I've checked it out. Because if I feel that you didn't listen to me, then I'll feel that I wasn't hurt. <coughs> Pardon me. So the other part of that is thinking about asking questions and communication. Patients don't understand often how to tell their story. And so we need providers to help us pull out those questions, tease out those questions, spend that extra few moments to get the story, to get what's really bothering. What, what's the chief reason that I came in? Understand that patients believe that that parent-child relationship, we talked about that earlier. They believe there's a parent-child relationship. I can't push back to the doctor because if I do, I'm going to get bad care. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. The other thing we have to do is recognize our biases. And this is something that's getting a lot more press and play because we're talking about disparities in care but recognizing our biases, unconscious biases. And I'll go back and I'll give a vignette of uh, a time that I was in the hospital with my son. And we were in the hospital over 28 days, and I had never missed a time of rounds. And so one day I come in, rounds always started at 9 o'clock, and rounds started at 9 o'clock, and I recall um, going into the tech. I said, hey, what time are rounds? And she says, well, rounds have already started. Or they've already finished with your room. And I professionally, but sternly, reminded this, this provider, I've been here 28 days. Rounds start at 9 o'clock. Why would I miss rounds? They brought in a nurse. I said, he said, uh, Colonel Coffey, we heard you had questions about rounds. And I said, yeah. I professionally, but sternly, reminded the nurse, I've been here 28 days. Why would I miss rounds? It started at 9 o'clock. They brought in a resident, and then they brought in the attending, and I professionally, but sternly, reminded them I've been here for 28 days. Why would I miss rounds? Seven years later, still have, I've never had that problem. But what they didn't realize is that they were sending me up the hierarchy of medicine that the longer the white coat, the less I want to talk to you. There's a bias. 
I give this that part of the vignette because there was a there was a patient in a room that was beside me. Now understand that when visiting hours are over, the family that you then inherit and grow as the people that are in the bedrooms beside you, if you're in a shared room, it's the nursing and providing staff that's there overnight that becomes your family. So I go to this uh, patient's room and I knock on her door. And I emphasize I knock on her door because that's her space. That's her home. I knock on her door and I say, hey, I've never seen you at rounds. Now, she looked like me, but she didn't look like me. I don't have tattoos on my neck. I don't have things. She's from Baltimore. I don't, she looked like me, but she didn't look like me. I said, I've never seen you in rounds. And she said, they never invited me. And I said, well, let me give you one piece of advice. When we're in the hospital, it does not matter about your social, economic, academic, financial background. You and I are the same person. We are two concerned parents who are here for our children. You need to make sure they invite you, and not only invite you, explain things to you so that you understand. Patients are that connective tissue that extend beyond the walls of the hospital. And so when I think about this idea of bias, it's not just race and gender. We often have biases toward insurance. We have biases toward uh, how many times if you're a frequent flyer of the hospital. I have a friend that's a sickle cell patient, and he can tell you the number of times he has these feelings and the comments that are made under people's breath about him being a frequent flyer when he's really coming because he's in crisis. I experienced not only bias because of potentially the way I was dressed when I came to bring my son to the hospital, but there was also a bias by rank. When I was perceived as a junior service member, I'm disregarded. When I come back as a more senior, more polished service member, I have results and actions that are taken. So biases extend beyond just what we see on the superficial side. The last thing I talk about is medical care versus health care. That's a little bit of a play on words, but I think it is um, one that is important. So when I think about medical care, that is to say that I would come in and tell you my left finger hurts and it's doing something. It, it, it's pulsating. I have this radial pain or whatever I'm going to say is wrong with me. And you as a provider will come look at me and you'll diagnose and you'll prescribe something and you'll say, here you go. I fixed your issue. But health care is more of an ecosystem. So I've got an Apple iPhone, I've got AirPods, I've got an iPad, that's the Apple ecosystem. For the people that have Samsung and the Androids with the green dots, we, we know who you are. <laughs> We're not gonna text you anymore. But I have the Apple ecosystem and those things all work seamlessly across. When we start to look at healthcare as an ecosystem, not just as the medical care, this isolated incident. But we start to say, when I'm a prescribing physician, I'm also thinking about, do you have access to clean drinking water? Flint, Michigan, Jackson, Mississippi. Do you have access to transportation? Because follow-up care is just as important as me getting you out of the hospital in the initial tranche. And so we have to start to think of healthcare as an ecosystem, not just in the text of having it, uh, the, the clinical problem that brought us in. So the, the thing that I would like to tell you guys again is I am extremely excited to be here. I thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, it was William Osler that said that good physicians treat the disease, but the great physicians treat the patient that has the disease. And so I, I hope and pray that um, through this talk and through your engagement that we all aspire to be great physicians who treat the disease and certainly take care of the patients. Thank you so much. Thank you. Colonel Coffey, thank you so much. Um, it is really such an honor to have a, um, a patient or a parent of a patient in this case come and talk to us um, and really great. Um, I, so we'll take questions both from the virtual audience um, by the live feedback and anyone here in the auditorium, please come to either microphone and we'll take questions. Um, while folks are heading over there. I'm going to maybe cast us a little bit more 
Um, you know, you rattled off some terms that a lot of us sat for a couple years in, in a classroom in medical school or nursing school to learn. And the, uh, I, I mean, I'm struck by parents of patients who seem like you get a medical education on the fly by necessity. Um, anything you want to share about that uh, experience yeah, as well? Yeah, I'll tell you, yeah. you're absolutely right. Um, you, you sort of get immersed in this idea of medicine is really something that involves me, right? If you had told me uh, when my son was born that I would have learned what galactosemia is and could tell you the S135 gene and the R192 gene that's recessive, negative mutated recessive gene, and I can tell you where, where, why he has galacti classic galactosemia, I would have been like, nah. But because I'm immersed in this world, uh, I've had to gain skills and knowledge and insight and read. And I would, I would go on a limb and say that every patient that is beset with some kind of critical or chronic illness, they learn these things. Um, and they know their bodies. And so, again, it goes back to this idea that we may not have the, the nomenclature and the words that you would use, but really valuing that perspective and valuing what we bring uh, is a, a crucial piece of data uh, to help us clear up that blind spot. Okay. Uh, Dr. Pitch here. Okay. So I just really want to – that was a, an incredible um, talk. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to commend you because you went through a, a nightmare of an experience and a lot of people would have taken anger uh, from that and really pushed away from the, the medical system. But I just really love how you've turned this around for the good in order to help, you know, you know, at a, at a worldwide level to, to make people aware of this. And, you know, I, I've learned from this, and I'm going to uh, talk to my lab to make sure they watch this because it's really good for us to think about this. Um, and I just want to hear more about how Stephen is doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Great question. Um, <clears throat> I think you're, you're right. Um, out of pain comes purpose. When your avocation, what you love to do, and your vocation, what you're paid to do, when those things intersect, you find passion, you find purpose. And certainly out of my son's pain, I've rediscovered, or discovered rather, this, this purpose uh, to help change this culture and course of medicine. So Stephen is, um, like I said, he's 11 years old, and my gosh, he is a handful. He is learning and getting his own personality which is a, a challenge at 11. Uh, I was telling folks earlier, so I'm an extroverted dad. He's a little bit more introverted and reserved, so I'm working through how do you raise uh, an introverted son, but he is absolutely discovering and finding his voice. Clinically, he's doing really well, uh, and that's a tribute to you know the work that you all do and the care and concern that you give to your patients, that we're not just numbers, right? I was telling somebody earlier, I was deployed uh, at one time, and this is back in the earlier stages of the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we would lose 20, 30 people a day. And I remember saying this, wow, we only lost 30 people today. That's good, right? Because I'm so used to seeing these high numbers of people that when they dipped down, it made me feel better. And then I was a commander, and I had people that worked for me that went out to deploy but did not come home in the same shape, form, and fashion. And those numbers became people, and those people became people that I knew, the stories, and those stories were families of mothers and daughters, sisters, brothers, et cetera, et cetera. And it took on a different meaning. And so the care and concern that you guys give to us as family members of the patient really makes a difference when you see us, when you don't count us as a widget, as a person, as a thing we're pushing through, but you look at us as we're part of this family. We're all in this together. And so I, I commend and thank you all for the work that you continually do, the tireless efforts. Uh, you know, I understand staffing. I understand resourcing. I understand all those things that are challenging. And you always have this commitment to put patients first. And, and that's evident by this, this program, right, and the focus we're having on patient safety week. So I appreciate the question. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, it was really interesting. Um, so I'm currently in uh, EMT class, and so we're – obviously with the pre-hospital setting. Um, and so it, it's really um, interesting to learn about um, patient, like patient care in, in, in a hospital setting and understand that. Um, so I'm curious, like, maybe what, um, what maybe you could see in terms of changing, like, pre-hospital care, um, like just helping, helping patients, like, before they're at the hospital. Um, and yeah, like maybe what insight yeah. or, like, advice or something like that that you might have for like interacting with patients um, yeah. in that way. So, so that's a really interesting question. Um, and I'll use this um, 
a project I worked on at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital and with MedStar Health in sepsis. Uh, so everyone understands sepsis is a very, very uh, tough thing to sometimes identify, right? And it has a very short window of time. Well, it, it's fluid, but there's a window of time where we can be really effective in sepsis. Uh, one of the things that we did was have an educational campaign in the community. And so this was not just providers coming to the community to talk, because sometimes there's still that fear of white coats, I don't want to go talk to you, uh, especially when you talk about communities that are generally show up on that spectrum for the disparities in those uh, populations, those patient populations. And so we had community members that were also partnered with providers to talk about sepsis. And so you had me, my son experienced sepsis and went into septic shock, um, who's sitting out there at a community health fair table talking about sepsis. And what it did was it allowed us to start an educational campaign that went throughout the entire Mid-Atlantic area for all of the Georgetown hospitals. I saw a banner on one of the uh, metro buses in D.C. that had, you know, talking about sepsis. Um, I suspect sepsis. There's a great video that's on YouTube as well that we pushed out. And so I think that by partnering with community organizations, churches and synagogues and you name it, to actually push out messages and information about medicine, it's how we start to get people before they come into the hospital. Uh, the other thing that I would also offer is that as we talk about this notion of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and disparities in care, it's making sure that when we go out into communities, that we go into communities and we try to have a representative force of the community we're going to go visit. And so I'll go and I'll give an example. Uh, again, I, I love MedStar Georgetown a lot. They saved my son's life. Uh, and what I appreciate is that they value my voice when I call things out. Uh, there was a time on the uh, residence wall, you know, in the, in the transplant unit, there were no persons of color that were there. And so what that said to me, that's not a one-year problem to fix. That's a six-year problem because you've got to go through the whole rotation. And I brought that up to uh, hospital leadership and, in fact, the president of the hospital was very receptive to that. But what it says without saying is that nobody from Howard University Medical School, from Meharry Medical School, is good enough to come to Georgetown. Because I guarantee every single person that's in medical school wants to go to residency, every single one of them. And so it's a deliberate action to make sure that we represent the patient population that we have. And that's, again, how we bridge those gaps and start to get people to tell us things before they come to the hospital, how we hit it off at the pass, if you will, because I've gotten people out in the community. I've gotten a representative population in the community that can also, you know, if I can see it, I can be it. If I can see you, then I'll, do, I'll have a, a deeper sense of trust. So, yeah. cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Look like we are. Dr. Like, Rickledge, do you have an online question? Or? Just one question. First of all, uh, Colonel Coffey, I just want to say thank you very much for everything, for sh you know, sharing your personal journey and, you know, uh, what uh, Dr. Fitzy was saying is taking an extraordinarily painful and, and negative experience and turning it to positive energy and making a difference. So I think that's all that we're put on this world to do, and I want to thank you for your leadership and advocacy. Um, I, ju I just have one video class question coming in. It's, um, and it is very specific, is did this child have a primary care uh, physician or pediatrician? Mm -hmm. Why were the physicians at two hospitals where the patient uh, baby received his earliest care not communicating directly uh, regarding a serious treatable diagnosis? So. so he did have a primary care physician, a pediatrician, um, and the doctor who had the very pronounced accent was very new to the military health system. In fact, they had just transferred from Nashville, and I'm from Nashville, uh, just transferred from Nashville to the military health system. And so <clears throat> I think when, and this is only speculation for why that provider called me and not called ahead to the hospital, um, maybe there was a different sense of let me come tell you, and you're able to kind of articulate that in military terms to the other military treatment facility. So my uh, hospital on my base was a smaller clinic. They did have um, an OB GYN or OB department there so we could have babies, but we didn't have a lot of beds in the hospital for, um, you know, long-term stay. The larger hospital that was at a naval base uh, did have those kinds of facilities there. And so I think why that provider uh, didn't call ahead to them was they thought they could tell us and that there would be some kind of translation of military speak. That's probably number one. Number two, it's a rare metabolic condition. 
And, you know, I, I jokingly say this, and I, I speak at DHA all the time. Um, you know, if you're born in the military health system with ten fingers, ten toes, you're, you're good. But when you're born with a metabolic condition that doesn't manifest itself outwardly, um, it's a little more difficult to diagnose. Lastly, the, um, the diagnosis was that there's a thing called centralized control, decentralized execution. So newborn screening is, you know, across the country. Everyone does it. But we execute it differently, i.e., in the state of Virginia, you had to have three positive tests for galactosemia to be classified as a person who has galactosemia. Whereas in Massachusetts, uh, there was a doctor who just retired up there. Was I'd like to call him the grandfather or godfather, rather, of galactosemia because he does this much research with it. If you have a single, here we think you have it, they will immediately tell you to suspend a galactose diet and so we verify. And so there's that centralized control. Everybody does testing. Decentralized execution done differently in the state that contributed to uh, Stephen having the miss and delay in the diagnosis. But he did have a provider. The interesting part about um, his primary doctor, which was a military doctor, and I am still friends with her today, and so there's a, there's a, a thing called survivor guilt, right? So she felt incredibly bad that she missed some things uh, early on, and so we've stayed in contact uh, for these number of years. But um, that provider was actually delivering a baby at the time. And so you had these kind of gaps and seams where there's a new provider to the health system. His primary pediatrician is one who's, you know, working and doing her stuff. It was over the holiday weekend. So there's a lot of gaps and seams that you can start to see within his story and experience that led to the diagnostic error and, and those types of things. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have been working in pediatrics for over 15 years, over 15 years, and um, the question I have, because I'm a big advocate for involving families and the patient, when it comes to very stressful situations, for example, um, a cold or a rapid response, and this is probably from your experience and from uh, your perspective, how do we engage the patient and the family? Because instinctively most of us tell the family you know move aside let's take care of the emergency but how can we best um, engage the patient and family well so I, I think the first duty is to save the life and so when there's a code and I don't have time to explain this to you because I'm trying to save your baby or save your loved one's life your first duty is to save life the second part of that is how you engage me after the fact. So I think that every patient understands that if something, the, the alarm bells and whistles go off in the hospital, something's going on. I may be, what's going on, what's going on? And you push me aside and I've got to do this. Once you come back to me and say, well, here's why we did that. They went through this code. They went through X, Y, Z, and a third. And it's really engaging with us at that moment that you start to, again, build trust. That's where the, the breakdown often happens when there's this lack of trust building. And trust building happens through relationships. And relationships, while they may be short in the hospital, they get microwaved, if you will. The number of times you come in and you are empathetic to me, the number of times you show me respect by knocking on my door when you're coming in, those things build trust. It is, it's not lost on me that many times you will have patients engage more with housekeeping and transport and food nutrition than they will with providers. Well, why is that? It's not because they see you more, because I see the nurse and the tech way more than I would food and nutrition, but it's the conversation. So if you're coming in the room and you're coming in purely on your business, I understand, you know, so, so let, me, let me not make this seem like it's rainbows and unicorns and You've got notes to do, you've got patients to do, you've got charting to do, you've got other things, you've got a family at home yourself, you've got your own stresses that you have to deal with, and patients seem like, well, why can't you deal with me? Well, we're people too. But it is a matter of trying to build the connections. It's a matter that you've come back to the room that you've engaged with me beyond just the clinical part. That, that actually when you do it on the clinical stance that you actually are very empathetic that you sound like you're engaged. It, it really is that bedside manner that goes a long way. And when we think about why patients come back to hospitals and why they don't, if you have a choice, certainly in this area you have choices, you come back because of the people. 
Every hospital up here does a great job of, of taking care of people, but you come back when you have a choice because of people. How did you make me feel when I was there? How did you make my family feel when they were there? Because those people are going to then, and certainly if you're in a fee-for-service um, hospital, uh, I shouldn't say it's fee-for-service, but when you're in a hospital that uh, you have to go pay for your services, um, the family members are going to be able to spread the word of, don't go back there. They don't care about you when you come. So it really comes back to the people business. Medicine has been and always will be a people business. When you go around, Colonel, um, what – actually, let me ask you a different question. The, you, you talked about, you know, seeing the patient. That's the most important thing. And all those um, – really taking those to heart. But if we got even more practical, if there was, like, one thing, either yourself or when you talk to other patients, they're like – if the folks sitting here are watching, when you go back to the wards, do this one thing we'd want you to do. It might make it a 1% better. Because some days we want to get 100% better. Some days we're like, can we just get 1% better? Uh, I think you should always strive for 1% better than you were yesterday. Yeah, exactly. Everyone goes for the, let's go for 100%. Right. Right? I want to get 1% incrementally better, and then over time it, it'll multiply. Uh, I think if there was one thing I could say that you can do right now, um, it really is respecting that patient. Like you would not believe how much it makes me feel a part of the team when you ask me, is there anything else? Is there something that I'm forgetting? And phrase it that way, is there something I'm forgetting? Because that invites me, because everyone wants to teach somebody, you love when you can mentor people. There's something I'm forgetting as the doctor. And I think that it invites the patient to then feel like they're part of the care team. But really respecting that patient and pulling them into and letting them know that you're appreciated, your voice is appreciated, your perspective is appreciated. And if I ask the wrong question or I say the wrong thing, to not make me feel like, man, he really didn't know what he was talking about. He used the wrong language. And people laugh, and people in the audience, you guys are laughing a little bit, but it happens. It happens in a condescending tone, in a negative look, in a comment that's said as you're walking out the door that I can hear back in my room. And so really respecting the patient and drawing me in, asking, is, am, I, am I forgetting something here? This is what I think. Sort of that teach back. Here's what I'm telling you. What did you hear from me? And am I forgetting anything? That really would make a big difference, I think. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, thank you again. I echo the thanks for this great presentation. And you sort of just answered my question, which was how do we – help providers, whether they're doctors, nurses, front desk, whoever the folks are, uh, recognize the power of the listen. Mm. And you just talked about that. Like, even if you don't have the answer or the solution, just to hear me out is huge. And you might get some information that could be helpful, but you might not. So I was just going to ask, what would you recommend? What would you advise? No, that, that's perfect. I mean, I, I think the, the biggest thing that we talk, you know, we talked about that psychological freedom. That's a cultural thing. When we have psychological freedom across the hospital, from the white coats and thethoscopes down to the environmental services team members. When there's that kind of psychological freedom, magic happens because everyone is a part of the team and everyone feels engaged and that their opinions and their voice matters. And that translates to the patients because if I know that if I'm a person lying in the bed and I'm talking to the environmental services person that's coming in to give me new towels and take out the trash, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, because all, we all talk. And they get a sense that their voice matters. My gosh, that just supercharges my belief that I'm going to have care that is inclusive and care that's safe. That's great. Okay, well, I want to thank you. I will give you the last word if you'd like, but that was a great tenure. But I do want to thank Colonel Coffey again for having the sort of courage to share your story both with us, and I know you shared it nationally and internationally, and for taking the time to come here today. So thank you again for coming. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for attending.